started with just a few housekeeping items. Our call is going to be recorded and the program will be archived on the Zero website within the next week. So if you'd like to share the program with others, please feel free to do so. The format of today's program will be as follows. I will introduce Zero, the Prostate Cancer, as well as our presenter, Dr. Thomas Baer. And then I'm going to hand the program over to Dr. Baer so he can share his expertise with us. And then at the end, we will wrap up with a question and answer section. So for those of you who are participating over the computer, um, to ask a question, I just ask that you type in your um, question into the question box. You'll see it um, as a user in the part, lower part of your screen. You can submit a question through there. I will continue. I will collect them throughout the program. And then at the end, we will ask those of Dr. Baer. We have an hour today for the presentation, and we will try to get to as many questions as possible. I'd like to thank our sponsor for today's program, Janssen Biotech, for their support. And for for those of you online, when you close out of the webinar, you will be redirected to a post-program survey. So I would just ask that you take a few minutes to complete the, pro complete the survey. It's very helpful for us um, to have your opinions about the programs because it gives us um, guidance as we do more programs. It should be very quick and take no more than 10 questions. So we're going to get started. Dr. Bear, if I could ask you to forward the, to the next slide, two slides down. Perfect. So who is Zero? Well, for those of you who are new to our organization, I'd like to just give you a little, little bit of background. Our mission is our name, and that is to end prostate cancer. And what better time to come together than during Prostate Cancer Awareness Month? So working together, we will save lives and stop pain and suffering by advancing research, encouraging action, and providing education and support to men and their families. And specifically what that means is that we do our very best to serve the community through a variety of programs and services. I encourage you to visit our website after the program to learn more. Feel free to contact me or my colleague Alice to um, learn more about how you become involved or about some of the programs that we offer. Just a few things that we're doing um, at Zero so that you can learn more about us. We have nearly 40 run walk events throughout the country this year. This is a great way to raise awareness, show your support, honor survivors, and have a great time. Check out our website to find out if there is a program near you. In September alone, we are having 13 events. Um, and I encourage you, if you are near one of the future ones, to come out and join us. They're really a nice time. We um, have a government relations and advocacy position on the Hill. And we have a research fund where we support scientific research to find new treatments and new diagnostic tools. We have a copay relief for men living with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. And we also do education and outreach programs and online materials as well. And we have a free testing database on our site. Next, next slide, please. And with that, I am exceptionally excited to introduce to you our esteemed and very dedicated um, presenter, Dr. Thomas Baer. Dr. Baer is the Grover C. Bagby Endowed Chair for Prostate Cancer Research, as well as a professor of medicine in the Division of Hematology and Medical Oncology and the Deputy Director at the Oregon Health and Science University's Knight Cancer Institute in Portland, Oregon. Dr. Baer leads the Prostate Cancer Research Program within the OHSU Knight Cancer Institute, which is an NCI-designated cancer center, making it one of the top facilities in the country. He received his medical degree from John Hop Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and then moved to Oregon, Oregon's Health and Science University, where he completed his internship and residency in internal medicine, and then went on to follow up with a fellowship in hematology and medical oncology. Uh, at this time, he is a fellow of many professional organizations, including American College of Physicians and the American Society of Clinical Oncology, Neurologic, the American Neurologic Association, as well as the American Association for Cancer Research. He has co-authored um, more than 350 articles and abstracts on prostate cancer, largely with a focus on the development of new um, therapies. He has led some amazingly impactful clinical trials, and he has recently co-authored a book, uh, Cancer Clinical Trials, A Common Sense Guide to Experimental Cancer Therapies and Clinical Trials. His primary research interests include clinical trials, preclinical investigation, and risk factors in prostate cancer. And very importantly, he is a member of our medical advisory board and a true champion um, for us and all men impacted by prostate cancer, and we are very honored to have him with us today. 
with that, I will hand it off to him to um, cover the agenda and then begin the program. Thank you very much, Dr. Bear, for sharing your time with us today. Thank you, Ivy. It's a wonderful introduction and uh, a wonderful opportunity for me to spend um, an hour with some very important folks. So I'm glad to be here and uh, glad to get a chance to chat with you today. Um, we're going to try to cover a lot of ground today, and I, I hope there will be plenty of opportunity to start managing side effects and staying informed questions that you should be um, uh, considering asking your doctor and, and, and how to be informed and involved. So, you know, the term advanced prostate cancer has a number of meanings depending on who you're talking to and what the particular situation is. I think the simplest um, way to uh, put it is that it's, it's a form of the disease that um, has escaped from the prostate gland and where cure through surgery or radiation is no longer possible. But that's a very broad family of, of medical conditions from uh, so-called biochemical recurrence, a situation when a PSA is detectable and going up despite initial therapy with curative intent, um, and more advanced forms like castrate-resistant prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer, and metastatic castrate-resistant. So um, the term castrate-resistant, by the way, is, is not a favorite of many, and it is scientifically very accurate. That it's condition, but what it means is that the, that the disease is progressing despite primary hormonal therapy. We used to have other terms like hormone resistant or androgen independent, but we've learned that many of these patients can benefit from additional hormonal maneuvers, and so these patients um, don't have cancer that's truly resistant to hormone therapy. They have cancer that's resistant to frontline hormonal therapy, and that's why the terminology has been developed. Um, a key distinction is whether there's metastatic disease or not. So uh, we can have either PSA-only disease, where there's a rising PSA but scans are clear, or we can have a situation where we see evidence of spread to bones, lymph nodes, liver, lungs, or other internal organs, and that's metastatic disease, and that's a a different situation, a more serious situation than rising PSA alone, and different treatments are considered in that setting. And of course, the most advanced form of the disease is metastatic disease that's resistant to primary hormonal therapy, also known as metastatic castrate-resistant prostate cancer. So we're covering a lot of ground uh, uh, that touch a lot of different people differently. Uh, treatment options for advanced disease can be very effective, and I think that's the first thing that we we discuss with patients when we face this situation. Uh, and uh, they can stop or slow the progression of the disease, extend survival, uh, improve quality of life. So there's a lot of reasons to be hopeful, even in the face of advanced prostate cancer. Regular tests to monitor the disease are a key component of management so that we can be sure that the treatments are working. And um, men can live for many years with cancer. I have a practice that I've looked after for a decade or 15 years uh, with metastatic prostate cancer, so that can, can and does happen. So let's talk briefly about the treatment options that come into play in this, uh, in this setting. Um, hormone therapy is perhaps the uh, most widely used treatment, and uh, a lot of folks have heard about that. The original form of hormonal therapy was surgical removal of the testicles, where most of the testosterone uh, is produced. Nowadays, uh, injectable drugs, the so-called LH, uh, RH agonists, or luteinizing hormone treatment, are the most common way to accomplish the same thing while avoiding surgery. There are also oral drugs, the so-called antiandrogens, um, that have been around for some time and play a role in typically in combination with the injections. And the latest generation of agents uh, we're referring to as androgen signaling inhibitors. These are drugs that have been recently approved 
and they substantially more effectively suppress the, the hormone, if you will, and have been shown to significantly improve survival and significantly delay the progression of disease. Um, hormone therapy can be used in conjunction with surgery or radiation in patients who have still localized disease that is at high risk, and in that setting it has been shown to um, uh, improve long-term outcomes and potentially cure rates, and it can also uh, be used in combination with chemotherapy or on its own in more advanced disease when surgery or radiation are no longer an option. A little more detail here for you, so um, uh, anti-androgens, the most common uh, anti-androgen is use, in use is bicalutamide. These agents um, block the access of hormones, principally testosterone and its related hormones to the receptor, the so-called androgen receptor, and that coupling of the hormone to the receptor is really the key event to activate the hormone receptor, and that, that's how hormones do what they do. So if you try to get in the way of that connection, you can interrupt hormones. Um, the conventional first-generation antiandrogens shown here, flutamide, bicalutamide, and nalutamide, are not as potent as the newer enzalutamide, which we are calling an androgen signaling inhibitor. Luteinizing hormone treatment um, shuts down hormone the production of testosterone actually by acting on the pituitary gland in the brain and shutting down the signal that tells the testicles to produce testosterone. This is the backbone of hormonal therapy and most men on the, in the United States who are being treated with hormonal therapy are receiving these injections either monthly every three, four, or six months. And the androgen signaling inhibitors are the newest kids on the block, if you will. Abiraterone substantially reduces the production of hormones beyond what the injections can do by a factor of 10. And zalutamide similarly is a much more potent blocker of the androgen receptor. And these agents have really revolutionized the management of castration-resistant prostate cancer, enabling men to uh, live longer with high quality of life. Um, the uh, digging even further, uh, the LHRH agonists, um, the drugs that you may encounter in that space are Lupron, Viador, Zolodex, Trellstar, Eligard, the brand names. Um, they are administered as regular injections uh, anywhere from once a month to every six months. The most common agents, um, uh, the LHRH agonists, um, can actually raise one's testosterone levels for the first couple of weeks before they fully kick in. And so there's one agent called Dagorelix or Firmagon that does not cause that flare. Um, Firmagon is only available in a monthly injection. It's, it's a little more difficult to administer. So uh, we often prefer the, um, uh, the other agents that give us the option of giving three or four month injections, but in patients who really have um, uh, a situation where they cannot afford a flare, uh, you know, patients who have pain already or extensive metastatic disease where a little bit of worsening could be really damaging, uh, those are the patients that we might uh, treat with a drug like Degorelix instead. Um, the um, uh, Degorelix is the, an LHRH antagonist, and um, again, the main feature here is that it does not uh, cause a surge of testosterone, and it is very helpful then in those patients who present with symptomatic or very advanced disease. Antiandrogens like bicalutamide and flutamide and nalutamide, most often bicalutamide in the U.S., are often given early on with um, the injections other than Degorelli because in line hormonal therapy, although they're less effective than the newer agents. Uh, and finally, um, the, the newest drugs that I've already alluded to, abiraterone is um, a very potent inhibitor of hormone production and not only acts on the testicles as does conventional hormonal therapy, but it suppresses hormone production all over the body, 
including, uh, believe it or not, in the cancer cells themselves. We've recently learned that uh, prostate cancer is not only um, capable of taking advantage of circulating hormones, but sometimes makes its own hormones, and that's how it gets around our treatments, and thankfully now we have drugs that can address that. Enzalutamide, on the other hand, as I alluded to earlier, is a very potent blocker of, uh, of the hormone receptor. So there are two different drugs that attack uh, roughly the same growth mechanism for prostate cancer. Side effects of hormonal therapy. Well, any man that, that's been on this will, will have their own story. Um, this is a, a partial list. The way um, you know, I think about this is uh, that there are some things that men feel, and those things may be anything from breast uh, pain or enlargement, uh, erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, sometimes bowel changes, but less commonly, mood changes, hot flashes. Uh, and then there are things that we need to be aware of that people may not feel, and that's things like uh, bone loss that can lead to osteoporosis, adverse changes in cholesterol levels, and perhaps an increased risk of cardiovascular events. Those are silent side effects until something happens, like a broken bone or a cardiovascular complication. So part of managing uh, uh, this type of therapy is monitoring for those side effects, interdicting those side effects if those occur, uh, and um, doing everything we can to prevent these side effects. I might, as an aside, mention that exercise, physical exercise, is a key component of living on hormonal therapy and can reduce the risk of fatigue, mood changes, osteoporosis, changes in muscle mass. So it's a key uh, component uh, for patients who are on hormonal therapy. Radiation, uh, we talk a lot about radiation to the prostate where it is a curative treatment. Once prostate cancer begins uh, to uh, spread, we no longer have the ability to use radiation to uh, cure the disease, but we do have the opportunity to use external beam radiation to relieve pain and treat lesions that are uh, or causing pain. And we have intravenous radiation as well, which has been shown to actually extend survival and delay the development of uh, complications from cancer. External radiation is typically delivered by these kinds of giant apparatuses that look like they came out of Star Wars, at least to a medical oncologist who doesn't deal with them routinely. It can be given as a single dose in some situations, and in other situations uh, it can uh, be given daily for two to three weeks. Um, two weeks would be typical. Uh, it really depends on the, the situation, whether a single dose is sufficient or whether multiple doses are required. Intravenous radiation, there are several agents, but the newest one here is radium-223 or Zofigo. Uh, this can be given by vein, and the molecules that deliver radiation home in on the skeleton deliver their radiation there and are able to kill cancer and reduce its ability to do uh, damage to the bones. This treatment is not useful for metastases to lymph nodes or other internal organs. It's really a bone-targeted treatment. Um, side effects of these treatments, well, for external radiation, it really depends on the body part that's being radiated. If we radiate, for example, a, a, a foot or a hand, there typically are no significant side effects, but radiation delivered to the center of the body can uh, cause nausea or loss of appetite or sore throat or really depends what what normal organs are in the field of radiation. But I will say that the doses delivered for pain control are relatively low compared to the high doses used for curative intent, and so side effects are much, much less common. For the internal radiation, it's generally relatively well tolerated, but we do occasionally uh, see folks who have fatigue, occasionally some mild bowel problems because radium in particular is excreted through the bowels and we always worry a little bit about the possibility of anemia or other low blood counts as a result of therapy. Immunotherapy or stimulating the immune system to fight prostate cancer is a very exciting area for 
research, there actually is one approved agent, Cepulosel T, that activates uh, a man's immune system. It involves a fairly complex set of procedures uh, in that in, uh, starts with collecting some white cells from the bloodstream through a procedure that's um, called a phoresis, which is similar to a, a dialysis for kidney disease. And these cells are then exposed to a prostate cancer protein uh, overnight uh, and a couple of days later are given back through an IV and the process is repeated on three occasions. Um, so far, immunotherapy has a beneficial but modest effect on, on prostate cancer, but there are many, many clinical trials that are examining uh, immunotherapy today. Some of the side effects of full cell T are mostly the side effects of a mild flu, and you can see those here, fever, muscle aches, and so forth. Those typically are a brief in duration, last a day or two, and rarely become severe. Chemotherapy is also an important part of the armamentarium against prostate cancer. In my experience, this is a treatment that patients are uh, most wary of, uh, but in point of fact, we have two effective agents, docetaxel or Taxtear and cabazitaxel or Jeftana. These were designed for use in older men with advanced prostate cancer, and they can be tolerated uh, well by many men with this disease. Um, uh, classically, these have been used in patients with metastatic castration-resistant disease, so disease that's progressed on hormonal therapy. But we've recently learned that a relatively brief exposure to chemotherapy early on, at the very beginning of hormonal treatment, can have a, a very substantial impact on long-term survival. So in the last year, we've seen really a resurgence uh, of the use of chemotherapy in prostate cancer. Chemotherapy side effects really uh, vary from person to person and from agent to agent uh, that we use. And by agent, I mean a, 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 the drug, not, not some sort of a CIA agent. Um, uh, but common side effects are low blood counts, which can include anemia. It can include neutropenia, which is a condition where temporarily the main infection-fighting white cells are in short supply, and men can be more vulnerable to infections. Um, nausea is actually usually quite well controlled, but can occur. Diarrhea, mouth sores, hair loss, fatigue, nerve damage in the form of numbness and tingling in the toes, and subsequently in the fingertips, allergic reactions. These are some examples. It's not a complete list of the side effects of chemotherapy. And what I tell my patients is that we, we will share with them the complete list. Nobody gets them all. Um, so um, by and large, most patients experience some of the side effects, uh, but for the most part, uh, they don't experience all of them. Uh, managing bone health is an important component of prostate cancer for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, the hormonal therapies that we use for prostate cancer uh, can cause loss of, of bone density or loss of bone mass. This is a condition that women who go through menopause are very, very familiar with and, and um, know that they need to be monitored for us. But men who are on hormonal therapy have the same risk. Accelerated bone loss is part of the problem. So one, um, uh, one issue that we worry about is osteoporosis. The other is uh, metastases of, of the cancer itself into the skeleton. And prostate cancer is uniquely inclined to spread to the bones. When the disease spreads in 90% of men, it spreads to the bones. Uh, so um, uh, the damage that the cancer can cause to the skeleton, which can present as bone pain, as fractures, as spinal cord compression with loss of sensation and strength even, um, those are important complications for, for prostate cancer. We manage these uh, by, first of all, careful observation <clears throat> uh, by uh, calcium and vitamin D supplements and by uh, adding medications that uh, reduce bone turnover and both treat or prevent osteoporosis and 
you at the same time reduce the ability of the cancer to damage the bones. These are so-called bisphosphonates, of which there are several, or the um, The doses are very, very different for these agents when they're used for osteoporosis and when they're used to uh, retard the cancer's ability to damage the bones. So it does make a difference which condition we're, we're treating in any given patient. Uh, for bone metastases, in addition to bisphosphonates and denosumab, as we mentioned before, radiation can play a role in, in dealing with uh, painful bone metastases. So in summary, this is uh, um, a, a table that reviews again and kind of brings together some of the things we talked about, but I do want to uh, acknowledge that these are partial lists of both how things work and what the side effects are. But you can see here on this slide, conveniently, the quick summary of the main treatments, hormone therapy, uh, which works through suppressing hormone signaling and has hormone-like side effects, such as loss of libido, erectile dysfunction, fatigue, hot flashes, and, and bone loss. And there's radiation, which kills prostate cancer by damaging their DNA and causing them to be incapable of uh, dividing successfully. Side effects tend to be low-dependent for external beam and tend to be either blood counts or gastrointestinal for um, uh, the intravenous forms. Immunotherapy is generally well tolerated except for flu-like side effects. Bone targeted uh, treatments um, generally speaking, are well tolerated, but there can be some side effects as shown here. And chemotherapy kills cancer cells directly, not through hormonal mechanisms, and has a, a long list of side effects that are shown in cancer. Um, gastrointestinal problems and nerve damage are some of the things we see with a fair amount of frequency. Clinical trials, we're not going to have an opportunity to really talk about clinical trials a lot, uh, but I just want to introduce the concept and, and, and uh, help you uh, find your way through this area if it's appropriate for you. So clinical trials are, are how we get new drugs, um, and it's been really a compelling period of time in prostate cancer. We have six drugs that extend survival for patients. Um, in 2004, we had none. In 2005, we had one, and the other six have come on. The other five, I'm sorry, have come on board in the last five years. So, clinical trials are really paying off, and um, the thousands of men who volunteer, tens of thousands, uh, we have them to thank in large measure for the progress that we've made. Uh, clinical trials um, have. Uh, a variety of designs. They can range from phase one testing where um, uh, we're really beginning to test a drug in human beings, trying to figure out if it's safe with the ideal doses and so forth, through phase two where we're testing uh, the initial level of anti-cancer activity. Is this drug um, uh, going to be helpful to, to men? And, and the phase three is where we really um, it's the Super Bowl of clinical trials. It's where the, the new treatment, which we found to be promising, hopefully goes head-to-head -head with the current treatment, and we see uh, which treatment ends up winning, and that becomes the next standard. So in many situations, a clinical trial may be appropriate for a patient, uh, and um, in many cases, a clinical trial may include the current standard therapy. So uh, uh, you need not worry that a clinical trial will always include a placebo or something like that. Uh, and when a placebo is included, often it's added to an active drug. So uh, getting to know what clinical trial options are for, for you when, when you have the need for treatment for cancer is a good idea. Uh, whether or not the trials are the right choice, that is really a very personal decision based on both the medical situation, what trials are available, but most importantly about personal preference and comfort. Um, clinical trials do offer uh, very close monitoring. Typically, there are uh, visits maybe more frequent and more detailed than, than in the course of routine care. Uh, and you know, the way to start on clinical trials is 
to talk to your physician to see if there might be something that you should consider. You can also find clinical trials uh, on many uh, web-based resources, the, the largest of which is uh, cancer.gov, which is the Na Na National Cancer Institute's um, website. Um, clinical trials are not limited to uh, new medications for cancer. That's what I focused on in my uh, introduction. But it is important to recognize that supportive care interventions are part of that. A at our center, we've done a lot of work studying exercise programs to prevent bone loss and uh, enhance strength and reduce fatigue. So uh, we can study um, supportive care and survivorship interventions. Um, quality of life studies, looking at things that reduce side effects um, or improve the quality of survivorship. Um, there are uh, cancer.gov is the NCI's website, clinicaltrials.gov is the broad clinical trials website that includes not just cancer clinical trials, but all clinical trials in the country. And those are good resources for anyone to explore uh, if they're interested in learning more about clinical trials. There are many, many uh, clinical trials for prostate cancer. Uh, this is just some examples, and I'm not going to get into the details of each one of these trials, uh, but uh, suffice it to say that clinical trials are testing novel hormonal agents, they're testing novel immunotherapeutics, they're testing novel targeted drugs that are trying to uh, get at the cancer in new ways that we're not yet using, and um, uh, I think there are many opportunities for men to consider these studies uh, if their condition is appropriate. Uh, just turning our attention for a few minutes to, to managing side effects. Um, many men you know, have long-term side effects from the initial treatment, surgery and radiation. And of course, um, the uh, sexual side effects of erectile dysfunction, sometimes also loss of libido and uh, voiding dysfunction, whether it's incontinence or urinary frequency irritation or common. These things are things that we would encourage everybody to talk to their healthcare provider. It's difficult in a talk like this to come up with a one-size-fits-all solution, but uh, there are many things that can be done, and men should not be living in silence with these side effects. They should be exploring their options for how to improve their quality of life and quality of survivorship. Uh, some of the examples of, of things that can be done uh, for urinary leakage, there's exercise and behavioral modifications. There are some medications, particularly for, for bladder irritability. Uh, and um, there are surgical options like the sling and the mesh and artificial urinary sphincter. Uh, surgical options are obviously more invasive but in more severe situations, they may be uh, an appropriate choice. And each man's situation is unique, and so uh, we wouldn't be making a recommendation towards one particular treatment or another, but just wanted to share that there are a number of options. Uh, erectile dysfunction and loss of libido uh, are common both with uh, the local therapies that can damage the nerves that drive erections, but also with um, uh, the hormonal effects of some of the um, uh, medical treatments that we use. Uh, there are many different interventions from the blue pill and related medications, local injections, uh, vacuum devices, implants. Uh, these issues are more difficult to deal with on hormonal therapy where the hormonal stimulation towards both libido and erectile function is missing. But even in that situation, uh, solutions are available. They're not perfect, but they're worth exploring. So staying informed and involved, um, you know, I think that one of the things that we encourage uh, folks to do is really engage with, uh, with their healthcare providers, understand their condition, ask the questions that need to be asked, and um, uh, you know, really uh, uh, steer their own ship together with with the appropriate healthcare provider. So, with that in mind, we've um, we're providing a, a list of sample questions that men may want to consider asking their healthcare providers. Obviously, 
uh, not each one of these questions is appropriate for every person who goes to the doctor, but it's meant to be a, a list that's a, a useful list to pick from and also a bit of an example. So obviously we'd want to ask about the results of any blood work, test results, imaging results, uh, and, and ask for an interpretation, especially uh, around PSA results and testosterone results. How often do those need to be checked and what are they telling us? Um, as, as physicians and other healthcare providers recommend treatments, I think it's important for us to understand how, why are they recommending those particular treatments? What are the criteria that they're using to determine which treatments are appropriate and which treatments are, are they actually recommending? Uh, once one is clear on the treatments, an important question is how soon does we need cases? It turns out that it's not urgent and there's room to um, take some time, consider it further, perhaps wait and, and enjoy um, some period of time without side effects before starting treatment. Other times things are urgent and it's important to understand. Um, it's important to understand what kinds of results one can expect from treatment, but both in terms of cancer response and in terms of side effects. And important to understand when these results are expected and, and what kind of monitoring will be done and, and when can we know that the treatment's effective or not effective. Obviously risks and side effects are critical and um, as importantly, what are the recommendations for dealing with the side effects? It may be too much to cover all that before treatment begins, uh, but um, what we would certainly consider is when a new treatment starts, a follow-up visit relatively early, after a few weeks perhaps for medical treatments, just to review the side effects, even before there is enough information to know whether the treatment's effective or not, uh, check in about any side effects and recommendations for treatment. Um, are there any lifestyle changes, diet or exercise, that can complement uh, and, and assist the treatment plan? Specifically for hormonal therapy, I, I can't emphasize enough the importance of physical weight. Um, so learning more, I think I'll turn it back over to Ivy uh, to discuss a little bit more about what Xero uh, can offer with regard to copay assistance and, and learning opportunities. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Barrett. This is just such an amazing presentation. Um, but I do want to let people know about a program that we have in partnership with the Patient Access Network Foundation. Um, we provide copay assistance to men living with castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Uh, and since our partnership began in late 2013, uh, we've provided more than $100 million in copay assistance to nearly 30,000 men. Um, so to be eligible for this program, uh, men must have insurance coverage for the medication that you're seeking assistance for, you need to be um, receiving your treatment here in the U.S. and reside in the U.S., 
you need to be um, actively treated for castrate resistant prostate cancer and then have an income level at or below 500% of the federal poverty level, which um, differs throughout the U.S., but equates roughly to around a little over 75,000 um, for a family of two for a year. Um, if you're interested in applying for the program or you think you're eligible, please, um, by all means, you can call the toll-free number here, 866-316-PANF, uh, which is 7263, or you can visit our website, it's a very easy application process. And also another resource for um, financial assistance are, is through the pharmaceutical manufacturers. Um, all the pharmaceutical manufacturers who create uh, advanced prostate cancer treatments have a financial assistance program. Each program is going to be different in what it offers. It'll be different in how it's managed and also who's eligible for it. So um, I, you know, it's very important if that's something that you're looking into that you um, contact the manufacturer of the drug. And if you're not sure about the manufacturer, you can certainly ask your physician um, and they can help you with that. And hopefully um, someone in their practice or their hospital can also help you to get some um, assistance if that's what you need. And then I'm going to talk just a little bit about how you can connect with Xero. Uh, if you could just give me the next slide, please, Dr. Bear. We are here to support you um, through your prostate cancer journey and encourage you to use our resources. Just some of the things that you can find. Um, we have videos and downloadable resources and brochures um, on our website. We have an advocacy mini site. And we also have a monthly e-newsletter, which you have an opportunity to sign up for at the end of the program. You can um, participate or volunteer at one of our run walks and give you a chance to connect with other folks. And then also, I encourage you to um, become one of our Zero's Heroes and share your journey with us because one of the most important things in helping us to reach other men with um, advanced prostate cancer is hearing someone else's story. And so we've, that's great um, information for people to share and to hear. Please feel free to contact me or um, my colleague, Alice Lee. Um, we are in the patient support programs at Zero and there are our contact numbers. You can also reach us. Uh, find our contact information on the Zero website as well. And fortunately, we have a little bit of extra time, so we, um, I'm going to ask some questions of Dr. Bear. Uh, we had a few come through, and I'm going to start off with Dr. Bear. Um, can you talk a little more about why you would recommend um, a man to take enzalutamide or abiraterone? You talked about how they both sort of act similarly. What um, would make you choose one versus the other? Yeah, that's a that's a wonderful question, and uh, I'll tell you, I, I I had the privilege of being um, at the first global consensus conference in Switzerland a little bit ago, where we brought together 40 experts from all over the world to come to consensus around some of these challenging questions, and I was asked at this meeting to be part of a two-person debate about uh, which drug uh, should go first, enzalutamide or abiraterone? And um, I, I was quite convinced that I won uh, handily, and yet when the audience voted, it was 50-50. So I can tell you that the universe of um, really thoughtful, knowledgeable people uh, pick one of the choice about half and half uh, based on their experience, uh, comfort, and, uh, and preference. The two drugs have never been compared head to head, so um, we can't really say that one is better than another. They've produced reasonably similar results in large clinical trials in terms of cancer control. They're both relatively well tolerated. You know, there are some specific situations. So, for example, um, uh, abiraterone uh, requires um, as a low dose of a steroid called prednisone to be given along with it. Uh, and um, it can irritate the liver quite a bit more often than enzalutamide. It can cause some changes in, in blood potassium levels. Um, and it needs to be taken on an empty stomach. So um, uh, some of those things might drive a choice towards enzalutamide. You know, for uh, the empty stomach thing is, is not usually a big deal, but there are some people who really have, have a lot of trouble with that. But you know, folks who have contraindications to steroids, maybe prediabetes or diabetes, um, who have trouble with their electrolytes or 
or, or, or have some inflammation of the liver already. You know, th th those might be medical reasons to pick enzalutamide. On the other hand, enzalutamide um, uh, is not indicated in, in folks who've had a history of seizures or a recent stroke, something that could provoke a seizure. And um, that might steer one more towards abiraterone. Uh, both drugs can cause fatigue, but in, in the hands of, of some folks, it, 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 the experience suggests that fatigue might be a bit more prominent in enzalutamide. So another thing that we occasionally do is start with enzalutamide and for folks who are having trouble with fatigue, consider switching over to abiraterone. But really, there is not a better drug. Uh, they're both good. Um, they, they're a little different, and um, uh, they can be used one after the other, although they're less effective on the second go-around. They're still effective for many patients, and there's not a simple answer of use one first and the other second. Great. Thank you. That's very helpful. And in fact, actually, we just got a, a, a question sort of to dovetail that somebody wants to know um, if you've seen anything in men who've actually taken Zytiga and Xtandi together. So I have, uh, we have not uh, used that combination. That's something that's under study currently. And um, uh, in our practice, we, we tend to um, largely stick to the to the data that's out there and we haven't seen enough data on on the combination and you know I, I would just uh, caution folks that um, although combining drugs um, like this is is very interesting and, and may in fact be a fabulous strategy of seeing good ideas pan out or not pan out and so when you combine two drugs, you might have a better effect. Um, you, you might have the same effect that you would have with one drug at twice the cost, or, or you might have more side effects and, and no no better effect. So um, I can't really comment very much. Don't have a lot of experience with the combination. I'd, I'd encourage folks who are interested in the combination, if there's a trial available, to sign up for that so we can learn from that experience as quickly as possible, and if, it, if it's a good idea, figure that out for sure so that we can offer it more widely to, to the general uh, population of patients with prostate cancer. Great. Thank you. That's really important information for people to know. Um, I've got a couple of questions about Cephulis LT or Provenge and sort of in terms of where does that fit into um, sort of the, the treatment process for men with advanced disease, and then a couple of more specific questions of how many times um, does a man have the, the treatment and how, for, how long does it take overall? Uh, Sepul cell T was studied in men with asymptomatic or minimally symptomatic metastatic prostate cancer, largely before chemotherapy, although there was a small percentage of patients who'd had chemotherapy. Um, the agent was studied before the modern hormonal drugs were available, so there's really no knowledge about, uh, from, from a data perspective, about how the, the benefits of Sepul cell T hold up in the era of uh, these newer, more potent hormonal agents. Um, the, uh, so if the drug is to be used, we, we would typically use it early on when hormone resistance is first identified. 
and um, uh, and when the patient is free of symptoms, doing well, and has hopefully a relatively slowly progressing disease. When we look at the landscape in the U.S., the reality is that the majority of men who are in this situation do not receive sepulal cell in this country. So that tells us that uh, patients and their physicians are, uh, you know, are choosing other forms of therapy. So I think, um, uh, you know, I th it's a it's a hard thing to address. I, I guess I would say, if if one uses the therapy, I'd use it early on, but not everyone uh, uses it broadly, and so w we tend to use it uh, in patients who are particularly interested in immunotherapy. Um, but we would like to see treatments emerge that offer a greater amount of benefit uh, for um, for going through the treatment like this. Great. And just out of curiosity, where um, is this something that a medical oncologist provides a patient, or where would somebody, where would a man go to get his treatment for um, sepulosal T? So typically, sepulosal T is overseen by a medical oncologist. I think there are a smaller number of uh, urology practices that have grown comfortable with that. So, you know, I'd encourage folks to ask whoever they're seeing about that. But it would be a, a bit more um, in the purview of medical oncologists in most cases. And it's not available everywhere because it's such a specialized treatment. So most university centers offer it. Some private centers offer it. Frankly, I haven't looked, but I would suspect that on the website for that company, you, you could probably find what centers offer it. I, I, have, uh, I don't know that to be true for sure. But uh, either that or asking one's physician about where the closest center that offers Cipolla cell T would be the approach to take. Great. No, thank you very much. Um, I have a question here about uh, from a gentleman who is, wants to learn more about clinical trials but is concerned. He knows his physician doesn't offer any and doesn't partner with anybody, and um, but he wants to learn more about them. He's a little bit concerned he might offend his physician, his medical oncologist. And how, how would you recommend somebody have a thoughtful conversation um, when about find, learning more about clinical trials um, to a doc that's not yeah. brought it up in conversation? Well, I, I would really like to see uh, patients be completely comfortable communicating with their physicians about whatever is on their mind. And honestly, um, uh, the vast majority of physicians are not easily offended and, and really shouldn't be. <laughs> I mean, um, and to me, a physician who is offended by a question about a second opinion or or a clinical trial is it, it really, it, that's a problem. That, that That's not the level of professionalism that, that we would encourage people to have. Certainly when we train our trainees, we, we drill into them that, um, uh, you know, we're here to, uh, to serve our patients' needs and part of their need is for um, the ability to access a range of opinions and information and we encourage that. We don't stand in the way. When someone asks about a second opinion, my response is, well, how can we help arrange that for you? Uh, where would you like to go? And if they're not sure, we actually help them identify somebody who is a really good expert to go see. So I would hope that once the doctor that this patient has is, is approached, they're going to respond in a similar mm -hmm. manner. And, you know, if they don't, I, I would view that as a, as a uh, shortcoming of a particular physician. Now, I do understand that, that some folks live in smaller towns and, and they may have uh, a limited number of oncologists available to them and, and they're w worried about that. And, um, you know, even in that situation, I, I think there are words one can choose that are very safe. You know, I would say something like, um, you know, I have every confidence in you and really appreciate the care you're giving. At the same time, I'm really interested in learning more about clinical trials. Uh, how would you recommend I approach that? Um, and, um, you know, I would find that very unthreatening if a patient said that to me. Great. No, thank you. That's, that's very helpful. Um, we have a couple of questions about oncolytic viruses for castrate-resistant prostate cancer. Um, one sort of just generally, you know, your perspective, and then another addressing um, specifically the 
the trial at Duke, the polio virus, and if just you had any thoughts on that um, as both treatment or as um, yeah. for me. Well, I, I can speak briefly to that in sort of general terms for the broader audience. I'm afraid I'm probably going to disappoint the person who asked the question because I we're not involved in, in, in any of the oncolytic virus trials, and so I don't, I haven't uh, maintained an, an intimate level of, of knowledge about that particular trial. But what I would say for the folks on the call that might be interested in that question is that the concept behind oncolytic viruses uh, is the idea that we can uh, uh, typically genetically engineer or design a virus that would be capable of uh, of killing when it's inside a cancer cell, but but incapable of doing so inside normal cells. And of course, viruses, uh, when they're active, they cause the death of the cells they in, they invade, whether it's HIV viruses or flu viruses or whatnot. So, this is uh, the oncolytic viruses are are custom designed, if you will, to to do that for us in the cells that we need to kill while avoiding others. Like everything else, um, the concept is very compelling. The devil's in the details and, it, it, and the clinical trials need to be done. Right now, uh, there aren't any oncolytic viruses that I'm aware of that have been approved for, certainly not in cancer, prostate cancer, that I know for sure, but I don't, I don't, I'm not aware of any in any cancer. So I think it's one of the many emerging and exciting technologies, uh, but it may or may not pan out in the long term. We're just going to have to see those studies through and, and see what they teach us. Great. Well, we're just about out of, time, out of time. Do you have a couple minutes to answer just two more questions that came in? Oh, sure. Oh, great. Thank you so much, and thank everybody for um, staying on the line. So we have a question about um, locally advanced prostate cancer and being treated um, at the multimodal approach of ADT surgery and radiation. And this gentleman would just like to understand your thoughts on sort of that approach and um, as a form of treatment and for being, yeah. being a very aggressive. Yeah, oh my, that's a, <laughs> that's a complex question. And I, I think um, uh, hard to answer comprehensively in something less than like a half hour discussion. Um, which I won't subject you to, don't worry. Um, but, you know, I think, let me say a couple things. First of all, we've learned a lot about multimodality therapy for high-risk localized prostate cancer, and it's very clear that for many situations, if radiation is used, hormonal therapy should be a part of that. Uh, the duration of hormonal therapy varies based on the level of risk from six months to as long as two to three years. Uh, with surgery, we often use radiation after surgery, and that's been shown to be beneficial in many circumstances. The use of hormonal therapy with surgery is a little more limited in terms of where the evidence um, uh, takes us today. It's primarily focused on men whose cancer was found in the lymph nodes. Uh, but the long and short of it is that combining therapies uh, in general has been shown to improve long-term survival and disease-free survival. Hard for me to comment on a specific situation where trimodality therapy is being considered. Um, it's certainly a reasonable strategy for some men, but uh, going beyond that, I, I, I'd need to actually see that particular patient in clinic to, to, to evaluate the situation to, to give better advice. Perfect. No, thank you. I think that's very helpful. Um, and it is important to know that you know every case is every man is very different. Um, and just one last question that came in: if you have any thoughts um, on nanotechnology as a tool against prostate cancer. Um, so nanotechnology is a very broad term that refers to very very small things. Um, and by things, I, I, I chose that term deliberately because there's all kinds of nanotechnology um, where we are interested in, in nanotechnology in cancer is a couple of aspects. One is um, as, a, uh, as a tool to deliver drugs with nanoparticles, so 
very, very tiny particles that can be uh, designed to be targeted to the cancer cells. Uh, and then the other opportunity with nanotechnology is around diagnostics and um, using custom design particles as probes, if you will, that can reveal the location and the presence of cancer. Um, so it's a very interesting, very broad field. Um, it's, I think, holds a lot of promise for the future. Uh, we're not using nanotechnology today in the routine care of any patients, so it's still one of those things that, um, uh, that we're excited about in terms of the future. Great. Thank you so much. That's, that's wonderful news, information, and you know, so much to hope for. Well, with that, I'm going to wrap it up, and I'm going to thank you again, Dr. Baer, for all of your insights and your expertise and for spending your afternoon with us. Um, thank you to everybody who attended. The questions were great, and we certainly appreciate it. Um, I'd like to just remind people again as they're logging off to please take the survey and, again, take the opportunity to thank our, our sponsor, Janssen Biotech, for their support for today's program. And I um, hope everybody has a wonderful weekend. Dr. Baer, thank you again so much. Oh, really, I really, really appreciate important. the opportunity, the wonderful questions, and um, hopefully we'll, we'll talk again. All right, great. Have a nice night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.